Do you have an ancestor with such a common name? It feels like it's impossible to figure out who they are, where they lived, and who their relatives are. Well, in this video, we're going to tackle common name research strategies. Well, the very first thing you should do when you're tackling an ancestor with a common surname or common name in general, like John Smith, is to develop an ancestral fact sheet. Now, this is going to include a lot of information such as what was their age or birth date or birthplace. The more details you can add, the better chance you have of keeping them separate from other people born at the same time and place. So what were their spouse's names? What were their children's names? What was their religion? Yeah, not every John Smith or Frank Townsend practiced the same religion. What was their ethnicity? Now, this is especially useful when you're researching in the South or any place full of immigrants. Many people took on names of people they knew as they anglicized their names or came onto records. What was their ethnicity? What was their occupation? If you have a Paul Smith that's a dentist, and you're getting him confused with Paul Smith, the professor, you pay attention to the occupations. What were their nicknames? I recently read an article about someone who went to visit a locality and he was looking for John Smith. And the um, local said, well, which one do you mean? Big Smith, Curly Smith, Death Smith, Bob Smith, or not necessarily Bob Smith, but they had all these nicknames. And the guy's like, I don't know, I'm just looking for John Smith. And, you, and the local said, excuse me, sir, every one of those is John Smith. Now, I don't know how accurate that quip is, but you get the idea. Use nicknames when you have someone with a common name that you're trying to sort out in a location. Now, I can't state this enough, look for spelling variations. Just because you have a, ne a name Smith doesn't mean that's the only way to spell it, S-M-I-T-H. You can have S-M-Y-T-H-E. Yeah, that's still Smith. So get all of the variations of how you spell your name. In just a little bit, I'm going to be showing you why you need to use timelines and how that can help your research. But in your ancestral fact sheet, create a timeline. Write down where everything is happening in your ancestors' lives. There are more tips and tricks on creating ancestral fact sheet. I want you to make sure you check the link in the description for my blog post that has all of the show notes and the links to additional resources to help you create an ancestral fact sheet. Now, after you have your ancestral fact sheet, go and reprove the details on that fact sheet. Because just because you think you know you have that information to be accurate because maybe you inherited genealogy from Aunt Ethel or maybe you've built your tree online, go back with a fresh set of eyes and reprove everything. Make sure the records say what you think they say. Make sure you actually have records for the facts that you think that you have and construct your family trees based on the reproving of that information. Once again, we have a link in the description for a video that you're going to want to watch called Peer Reviewing the Research of Others. But I want you to watch this video it, with the mindset, ah, I need to peer review my own work. So be sure that you get familiar with the description under each video. Next, when you're working with ancestors that have common names, you need to have a research plan. In a previous video, Elise Scalise Powell told us hope is not a research plan. You have to develop a question and then work your way through that question to its final conclusion. And one of the reasons why you need to do this is because you're going to realize, hey, I have this question and a lot of records answer this question, but I'm missing those records. We have videos talking about Elise's uh, research plan, how to develop that. And we also have videos that talk about how to find 
what records might be missing to answer the questions that I have. Check the show notes below. But let me give you a brief overview of some of the records that you might be missing on your fact sheet. Birth, marriage, and death. Now, birth, marriage, and death is a modern invention. Those records may or may not exist for the time and place that you're researching. But if they did exist at the time and place that you're researching for your common name ancestor, you want to go look up those records. Others, migration records, military records, land records, religious records, city directories. If you've been here a while, you know I love city directories. If you haven't, you need to learn to love city directories. Census records, newspaper articles, wills and estate records, court records, tax records, and then some uncommon genealogy sources that my friend Lisa Leason, who has her own YouTube channel, talks about. All of these information so that you don't have to take notes while you're watching will be available in the show note blog post accompanying this video. So once you come up with what records could possibly answer your question and you might be missing them, then you need to go find out if these ac records actually exist for the time and place you're researching. The Family Search Wiki will help you out. And we have a video about the Family Search Wiki and how to use it. Check for the link in the description. Now, once you have pieced together all of the information on your fact sheet, you need to ensure that you're constructing a family tree based on of all of that information. So one of the places that you can do that is Family Search because it's free. But you could use Find My Path, My Heritage, or Ancestry, as well as some other services like Ginny and Wikitree. All of the links to those websites will be in the show notes. But when you build your tree, on family search. The other thing I want you to pay attention to is reconstructing the world around your ancestors. Who were the extended family members, the in-laws, the great uncles, the neighbors, the witnesses to their documents? Who were their friends? Who are they buying land from? Who are they the godparents of or who were their godparents? Do you notice how this tree is going to be quite large if these additional people that is called the fan club, if they're not part of your direct family? So what are you gonna do? You're gonna go use family search and you're gonna build all these extra little trees over on family search because when you've solved the mystery of who is your John Smith, using all of these extra people, you can abandon the research you did and just focus on your John now, and you have the additive benefit of leaving that research for others. This is the one platform that is wonderful for that type of fan club research to take advantage of it. Now, when you're constructing their world and constructing their family, you might have to go even further and do a surname study. Yeah, if you're working with the last name like Smith, it can get overwhelming, but there are projects in the Guild of One Name Studies that we have a video about here on our channel, and you can assist in a surname study or you can start your own. But the idea is to search everyone with that surname and you might be able to figure out who your common name ancestors are. This is definitely something to explore after you have exhausted all of the possibilities that you have, or if you have multiple people that you're trying to keep straight and you want a location to house all of that research. Now, another strategy that I have used to try to figure out who my William Townsend is, because there's a lot of William Townsends, is I did a twist on the one name study, and that is a one name in one place study. I've researched all the Townsends in Franklin County, Ohio, who lived there in 1880. I went back, I went forward, and I was able to isolate the likely siblings and a potential uncle 
for my ancestor, William James Townsend, when records didn't exist to help me figure out my common name ancestor. If you want to read about that series, then make sure you check the blog post show notes that are linked in the description. Whew, you're going to have a lot of content to binge watch. And I'm so glad we've gotten to this point where we can help you in that way. You've got to use analytical tools. I recently attended a workshop talking about how to separate two men of the same name. And one of the things they these instructors said was to use clue webs. Well, I have a video on how to create clue webs and you can find that link in the description as well as the show notes. But clue webs are fascinating ways to piece together the clues that you have in another format. It's fine to put things on genealogy charts, but sometimes your clues for your individuals make sense when you utilize a clue web. Now, as promised, I also mentioned making timelines. Take advantage of timelines because these help you figure out who is related to who and how. So how are you going to figure that out? Well, here is Nathaniel Gordon. And many of our longtime viewers know that he is not my relative, although many people put them in their, his, their family tree related to my Charles Gordon. What I think is happening is people are confusing Nathaniel Charles Gordon, who was born in Virginia and migrated to North Carolina, with another man of that same name and age. And we still haven't figured out him. But when you start looking at this timeline, you start thinking, you know, in 1778, he has three children, or 1778 to 1780, he has three children in North Carolina. He has another one in 1784 in North Carolina. So why would they have gone up and had another child the same year in South Carolina? It, it, it's possible, but it's going to be kind of rare when you see that there's one child born so close to one another. So we're going to take off that South Carolina one. So then you go down and then we have them in North Carolina and they go to Mississippi and come back. Okay, so if this guy had dual families, maybe, maybe that would work. But these children are attributed to the same man and the same woman. So that's not likely. I'd like to see more proof of it, but we're talking in a time period where the records are pretty rare <laughs> to find. So then we have two children born in Pennsylvania. So they go to North Carolina, they're in North Carolina, and they go to Pennsylvania, and they come back to North Carolina, and they go to Pennsylvania. I am sorry, that doesn't make any sense. Do you see the power of timelines and putting your information out that you start finding, ah, maybe not only do I have just one Nathaniel Charles Gordon hanging out in North Carolina, but it's entirely possible, but there's multiple, one that went to Mississippi, one that went to South Carolina, one that went to Pennsylvania, and one that went to Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> so another way that you can piece out your timeline is that you can use Family Search and My Heritage, where they have map your ancestors. You can look at an individual ancestor, look at the um, events that happened in their life, and see them plotted on a map. When you see something happening, like Nathaniel Gordon, where there, he's all over the place, chances are you have some confusion. So can something happen in a odd location? Well, absolutely. My father was born in Ohio. He migrated to Ohio, Texas in the 70s, but he died in Vegas, but he was buried in Texas. So what happened? My father died on vacation. So things can happen in an unexpected location, but you definitely have to have proof that makes that make sense for the time and place and the technology for transportation available at the time. That's a lot to get you started. I really hope that you will check out the show notes that um, I link to in the description, as well as some of the other videos already available for you on the platform. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button so you can get more genealogy research tips as well as check this video for how to be a better genealogist.